Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and a very warm welcome to a very special evening. Um, on behalf of both uh, the Austria Institute for European and Security Studies, uh, where I'm a fellow, and uh, of the Foreign Ministry of Austria, where I have spent most of my adult life, uh, I welcome you all, I think, in particular, our panelists are very much looking forward, and I promise I will be very brief because we want to listen to you uh, and not to me. Uh, also, uh, to the Diplomatic Academy for hosting us, and uh, to you all for being here. Uh, when I say this is a special evening, I wish I could say something good about this special evening. Maybe I can, but the evening is about two of the global tragedies of today in Ukraine and in Afghanistan. Uh, and these are tragedies which should not take place, certainly not in the 21st century. And these are also tragedies which have a particularly bad impact on women and children. Uh, and in a way, I, I would say violence against women and children, even without a war, makes one speechless. And still, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about it today and every day, uh, especially, of course, in the context of a war of aggression or of a post-war conflict situation, uh, of a war where not only war crimes are committed on a, on a daily basis, but where Women and children are the first uh, to suffer. Uh, and uh, it's obvious that every crime is one crime too many. Every violence against a woman or a child or anybody is one, cr one violence too many. And every victim is one uh, too many. Uh, and we read about so-called untold stories of horror. But these stories need to be told and we need to hear them, and the world needs to hear them. Uh, and we need to hear them not only uh, for reasons of sympathy, but we need to hear them for reasons of accountability and of response. Uh, and I think this is what we are hoping uh, to achieve uh, tonight uh, with, our, with our panelists. Before coming to them, let me just uh, say a word uh, of uh, why the foreign ministry is particularly gladly supporting this, uh, this event. Uh, this is part of our civil society support program in uh, what uh, the new UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has proclaimed Human Rights Year 2023. Uh, 75 years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and 30 years after the Vienna World Conference, on human rights, he wants to rekindle the spirit uh, which was so much present both in Paris, where the Universal Declaration was adopted, and in Vienna at the World Conference. And that spirit was largely carried, I would argue, by civil society representatives who were pushing government representatives. It's civil society uh, which, uh, which has made uh, these progresses uh, possible uh, and sustainable. And this is also why we support civil society projects throughout the year. Uh, I think there are several dozens of them uh, precisely to sort of not only support the High Commissioner, who is an Austrian, uh, Volker Türk in this regard, but also to, uh, to help us uh, to bring human rights also to home uh, in, 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 in Austria uh, itself. And I think this is also what one can say about the, uh, the panelists uh, today. Uh, because if these are two terrible tragedies, uh, there is also a, a flicker of hope. And that also is carried by civil society, by, by organizations who support, who protect, who find safe spaces, uh, who uh, create uh, uh, support for basic necessities, not only in Ukraine, but also in surrounding countries, including in our own country. 
Uh, and uh, the same, of course, uh, goes uh, for the countries around uh, Afghanistan. The panelists in the first panel, we very much uh, would hope that we can hear more from you in, in also in, in this regard. Where is, where, is, where is the hope? We are admiring your courage, your stamina, your, your perseverance, uh, and your optimism against all the odds. And I think we, we all share in, in, in this and, and uh, how we can do more in, in support, not only in support for victims, but in support uh, of, of, of civil society organizations altogether to ensure a bigger space for women in public life, in, in politics, of course, in political participation, uh, in reclaiming public space, uh, which in, in the case of Afghanistan has become so much of a, of, of a near uh, impossibility. The framework, the international framework, the conventions, the international law, Women, Peace and Security uh, Roadmap, it's all there. Uh, but it's in the end, depending on every single one of us, how much uh, support can be generated. And in this regard, I'm very much looking forward uh, to our uh, discussion tonight. And I'm very happy to hand over to my vice president at IS, uh, also a longstanding uh, former member of the uh, Parliament of Austria, Nationalrat and uh, also president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE, Christina Muttonen, uh, for moderating uh, tonight's uh, evening. And thank you very much uh, for your attention and for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Strohal, he has been working, you have been working a lot for the OEC as well and ODIA uh, and trying to help um, civil society and the different states um, on the way to democratization um, and a, a very important work which um, we are very thankful and grateful for you that you, that you did that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear audience, um, yes, you already heard, we are celebrating 30 years of the Vienna Declaration, a landmark document uh, in the field of international human rights protection. This uh, Vienna Declaration demands greater attention to the rights of women, and as the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Türk, said, you cannot have one human right without another, without the other. So it's human rights are universal. Already in the 1995, uh, in 1995, at the fourth UN uh, World Conference on Women in Beijing, it was stated that women's rights are, of course, human rights. All big organizations such as the UN, the EU, the NATO, OEC, consider gender equality as an integral part of their policies. Many states do have national action plans on gender equality and the UN Resolution 1325 is one of the core issues of that. But the question is, how do we manage that those plans are taken seriously? What needs to be done that the laws are well implemented? And as Ambassador Strohal said, there is hope. Hope, we hope to hear from you also. So what civil society is doing and uh, where we can learn and support. But as we can see now in times uh, of instability, women's rights cannot be taken for granted. We have to understand that we have to fight for these rights day after day. We um, are definitely in a time of crisis. We have so many different crises popping up all the time. 
and it's really difficult how to manage them. The ongoing war in Ukraine is a catastrophe for the country, its population, and is a deep crisis for women and girls, as is the situation in Afghanistan. And we know war has a disproportional uh, impact on, on women, such as increased based violence, sexual exploitation and trafficking, even transactional sex for food and survival, drop out of school, early forced marriage as a result of war, loss of livelihood, food insecurity. On the other side, when you go to Google and type in, you know, the topic of our second uh, panel, of our first panel is women agents of change. When you type in women agents of change, it is incredible what you get. Women are agents of change in connection, mentioned in connection with climate change, entrepreneurship, education, in the fight against drugs, for sustainable development, agents for peace building and peacekeeping, etc. So there is a lot of burden of trust, of confidence, putting on the, sh on the shoulders of women. But the question is, are the are women enabled to do that? What is meant that they could do, not should do, but could do. But certainly we have agents uh, of uh, change here as our guests today. So we are very pleased and very honored you have to have you here. And we start with the first panel and um, we will uh, we are looking forward to hearing about the situation in Ukraine and what are the possibilities, what can civil society do, what can we do, where can we support you. Thank you. We have uh, Tamara Slubina. She uh, got, unfortunately, she got sick, so we'll, she, will, she will join us uh, per video call. Um, Tamara Slubina, she's a gender expert and head of the NGO Gender in T Detail Ukraine. She is, um, her expertise lies in, in gender studies, feminist research and activism, gender mainstreaming for state institutions, businesses and NGOs. And she is also working on transformative process, pro, processes in Eastern Europe and media management. Uh, Tamara publishes uh, num or published numerous articles. And um, we are really pleased that you can be here with us, uh, that you can join us. I hope, uh, I, hope uh, I wish you all the best for your health getting uh, healthy soon. Um, I want to um, welcome Ina Shervchenko, the leader of FEMEN, um, a journalist, a Ukraine feminist activist, and the leader of the international women's movement FEMEN which often demonstrates against patriarchy, especially dictatorship, religion, and sex industry. She was you, threatened various uh, times by uh, secret services and was granted asylum in France in 2013. And you work as a journalist, um, publishing uh, for different uh, journals like the uh, newspapers, like The Guardian, The Huffington Post, also CNN. And Tetiana Kudina, very welcome to you as well. I'm very pleased to have you here. You are working for the UN Women in Ukraine, the head of the programs. Um, your occupational background is um, the program coordinator at UN Women, but also working for the UN Development Program. So always trying to make women visible, but also to see whether their rights, um, whether they get the rights or not. So thank you very much for being with us.
So now I would like to ask Tamara, um, how is the situation in Ukraine? How is the women's movement? And how can you contribute to strengthen the women's movement? So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Dear participants, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't join the event, but uh, I am very sorry that I cannot communicate with you directly after the event. So I hope that maybe some mixed discussion will happen in this virtual format. And I am very glad to have a chance to exchange opinions because uh, there are a lot of lessons from Russia's war on Ukraine that should be made in the context of defense and uh, security in Europe in general and participation of women in defense in particular. I will try to present you my ideas and uh, I hope uh, for some feedback from you. Uh, I will talk about a comprehensive defense paradigm, because I'm a philosopher, I talk about paradigms, first of all, that uses feminist policies and gender mainstreaming as critically important components of resilience and defense, because these comprehensive defense systems enable the full utilization of human resources, of course, in the context of women's engagement and also in the context of defense in Ukraine. The idea of a comprehensive defense system refers to a strategic approach that goes beyond traditional military capabilities and involves a broad and integrated set of measures to safeguard a nation's security. And it's important that it goes beyond military, so it's not only military. It aims to address a wide range of potential threats and includes various dimensions of security, like not only military, but also economic, political, social, and in even environmental factors, and etc. Comprehensive defense approach is implemented mostly by Nordic countries, and uh, sometimes it is confused with the uh, Israeli system, but Israeli approach emphasizes first of all traditional military defense, and comprehensive defense, once again, is not uh, only about military. That's important, and you will see why there is a feminist importance in it. So comprehensive defense systems have two main feminist aspects. The first one is diversity, equality, and inclusion policy within the military sphere. And the second one is a paradigmatic shift from military defense as a sole method of, de of defense to comprehensive measures that involve civilian agents capable of ensuring resilience in different spheres, which is much more suitable for contemporary hybrid forms of warfare and which are more accessible to women. Although Ukraine does not have comprehensive defense, defense doctrine, by my observations, the Ukrainian volunteer movement serves as a substitute for a comprehensive defense system in Ukraine. Crucial components of such an approach, uh, like business and citizen engagement in defense by supporting the military, addressing social issues, and developing cybersecurity and resilience against disinformation and propaganda, uh, are being carried out by Ukrainian volunteers and civil society organizations without state supervision. Women contributed significantly to the success of Ukrainian volunteer movement. And now we can see that this concept of comprehensive defense, if properly localized, can create a foundation for large-scale feminist transformation of society and state institutions. This would provide visibility to women's contributions, establish the structural conditions for their active participation in defense, reconstruction, and country development, and help overcome sexism and homophobia. And emphasizing the importance of women's participation in defense is highly needed now. Why now? 
Contrary to stereotypical feminist predictions that war would lead to a con to conservative shift and increased patriarchal tendencies in society, this did not happen in Ukraine after the onset of Russian war in 2014 and until 2022. In contrast to Russia, where the dictatorial regime utilizes machismo, homophobia and conservatism as part of the state ideology, in Ukraine, gender equality and LGBT plus rights were seen as a part of European integration. Until 2022, feminist marches and LGBT pride events were regularly held in various cities. Active women's participation in volunteering, including military volunteering, led to significant gender changes in social, military and political spheres, giving rise to influential public feminist debate. The full-scale Russian invasion halted the successes of feminist movement and burdened society to an extent that became threatening to the further development of gender equality and inclusivity. Ukrainian women now face many challenges. The full-scale invasion of Russia has destroyed a significant portion of social infrastructure, caused an economic crisis, and compelled tens of millions of people to relocate to other regions within Ukraine and to other countries. Material challenges are supplemented by symbolic shifts that threaten perspectives of gender equality in Ukraine. Direct participation of mostly men in combat became literally essential for the country's survival. This leads to a symbolic division between military and everyone else, where military personnel, especially combatants, receive exclusive status and base in society. Although around 50,000 of women serve in the Ukrainian army, their contribution is undervalued. With the onset of the full-scale invasion, the number of female experts in the media sharply decreased. Women constitute the majority of the volunteer community now. However, there is a trend of forming a symbolic glass sailing. Most ordinary volunteers performing unpaid work are women, but most leaders of prominent volunteer funds, which have recognition and significant symbolic capital, are men. Now, after two years of full-scale war, it uh, should be acknowledged that the war may endure for an extended period. Of course, I hope that the war will end soon, but uh, we, we don't see uh, signs that it, it will happen soon. So it can be really a very long war. So even in the case of a compromised ceasefire, the threat from Russia will persist. This inevitably leads to the transformation of all aspects of Ukrainian society into a defensive mode. Anything that does not contribute to defense may be devalued and rejected by the state and society, including uh, critical, crucial elements such as the reproduction of human capital through reproductive labor. For these reasons, Ukrainian feminists should be realistic and shape policies within the context of defense, resilience, and societal survival. My, my hypothesis is that a comprehensive defense approach has the potential to serve as a conceptual framework capable of altering the defense paradigm paradigm in Ukraine, incorporating civilian aspects already been addressed by the volunteer movement. This approach aims to empower women and enhance their symbolic capital within the context of defense. Appeals to human rights, justice, and universal values of equality may not work in the context of prolonged existential war for survival, where all societal and state resources must be utilized as efficiently as possible. In this situation, every individual, along with their knowledge and skills, should be maximally utilized. Gender and other stereotypes hinder this efficiency. Sexism and homophobia in the military directed towards women and LGBTQ service members represent a wasteful depletion of resources. 
Sexism affecting the leadership and professional potential of women in civilian life is also a squandering of resources. The challenges faced by women due to caregiving overload represent a resource drain. With this shortage of people to Ukrainian needs, immediate acknowledgement of this scarcity is crucial. In the context of comprehensive defense paradigm, feminist policies and gender mainstreaming stops seem untimely and can be presented as critically important components of resilience and defense because they enable the full utilization of human resources. Thank you very much for your attention of this quite short presentation. I am very thankful uh, to be with you and I hope to hear your feedback on this uh, paradigm of this combination of uh, uh, comprehensive defense and feminist policies and to have some discussion about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights. Uh, very interesting for us. Um, we continue with uh, you, Ina, if it's possible. Uh, we would be very pleased if you could tell us uh, about what you think the situation in Ukraine is and uh, what your work from your perspective, um, how has it changed in the time of war? Right, thank you very much. Um, indeed, we all know, I think, that um, we can say it for sure, that war is not a woman's history. Nevertheless, in today's world, we see that war becomes increasingly, once again, woman's reality. And studying and focusing on women in conflicts and in war times has, of course, um, you know, importance in many regards. But um, especially when we hope for some share, at least some share of justice in a post-war society. But I think that um, throughout the history, um, the biggest interest for looking at women during war times and in conflicts was that I think that women, more than men, um, can strip war from, from glamour and old-fashioned Harry's. Because indeed women are, as it was said, more often are first victims of all wars and all military conflicts. And it is the case of Ukraine. Yes, we are used to um, talking about women as victims of war. It is the case of Ukraine, as it was said, that women and children constitute the majority of refugees forced to leave their country or displaced within the country. Um, very often, and especially the first wave of those refugees uh, to Europe, uh, women were exposed to sexual trafficking. There are many cases, and I believe that, unfortunately, there was not enough work done recording those cases, and it is very difficult, indeed, to record them, especially in the countries where sex industry is legalized, where it's very difficult to track those cases and even more difficult to criminalize them. Um, and, of course, I think today we have enough reasons and enough facts, enough testimonies to claim that sexual crimes and rapes were and are used in Ukraine as a weapon, as a, I would even call it, an invasion strategy of Russia. I think that Ukrainians in the room would struggle to escape from, you know, and stop ourselves from sharing personal stories. Um, my, I'm, a, I'm a girl uh, from, I was born, I'm a child of southern um, uh, city, Ukrainian city, Kherson, which was occupied for a long time. And my family um, experienced this occupation and lived through Russian occupation. And in my hometown, Kherson, we have enough testimonies to claim that rape was used as a sy systematic acts of aggression. It was used as a weapon. I remember how, while I was trying my best in France, um, going around uh, all the plateau télé, trying to plead for the case um, of Ukraine and support, Western support, I remember receiving after um, such uh, interview a call from my sister, who was at that time in Kherson, 
weeping, saying that we hear how women in the streets are raped. It was one evening where I would say what happened was, you know, they staged a rape campaign one evening. And these stories and testimonies we collect, we have them collected already. Um, and I believe that I hope that the International Criminal Court is doing um, an important and, 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 and responsible part of this work. Um, we have those testimonies collected from most of the territories um, that were occupied um, and were liberated then by Ukrainian forces. So we have enough reasons and facts to, to claim that rape is used as a uh, war strategy. And of course, women and children, we have, we have testimonies and records of crimes committed, such, such sexual crimes committed against children, are the uh, primary victims of those crimes. Um, and as a parenthesis, I will add here that Unfortunately, and we know it, that sexual violence and sexual crimes very often um, are maintained, you know, even in a post-war societies. They shift from being a strategy of the aggressor to, um, you know, they shift and move to a private spaces, to households in a torn by war society. So I think that already today, Ukraine, Ukrainian society needs a lot of support and help in this regard um, to minimize um, this, this danger that women will face, will continue to face even in a post-war um, Ukraine. So we are also used to, of course, here speak about women in conflicts as um, household heads. Um, Ukraine, that's also the case of Ukraine, um, with a nation, nation a large mobilization with a lot of men volunteering uh, to go to the front lines. Many communities um, are led by women, many um, small villages, um, entire communities survive sometimes thanks to women. Um, we see a lot of cases uh, of women um, you know, continuing to operate, in, uh, opening shops, pharmacies, hospitals, schools, kindergartens. We see on everyday basis how women risk their lives to bring some normalcy to life in a, um, uh, Ukraine that is facing this uh, war aggression every day. Um, we're also used to speaking about women during wartime as combatants and um, to a small extent, but nevertheless, it is also the case of Ukraine. Um, it was mentioned that um, estimated there are 15%, well, 60,000 uh, women are uh, fighting, um, are in, in the military uh, forces in Ukraine. And of course, if we look closer, of course, Ukrainian military will not stand the feminist criticism. Of course, there is, there is, we are very far from any gender parity, but I think that Ukraine made a quite a remarkable um, transformation and quite remarkable efforts very fast and in a very extreme situation to integrate women in the military. And this, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that we see that women are more often uh, kept away from the front line and kept away from the combat groups rather reflects, I think, a general tendency in all um, um, uh, military forces around the world. But nevertheless, that's also the story of Ukraine. And then, finally, we, of course, hear a lot during war times and when we look at different conflicts, we hear about women being peacemakers. Um, and that is interesting here, and I would like to um, bring my perspective to this, because we very often hear about women being peacemakers as such that very often push for anti-military, for non-military solutions. Um, you know, the, the call to lay down the arms and stop fighting. Uh, in Austria, I think it's quite known, this appeal, die Waffe nieder. Um, and I think that um, this is very interesting and remarkable point for me about Ukraine and Ukrainian women here, because this is not the case of Ukraine. If you will look closely at um, the appeals that come from women as groups, but also individual actors, of course, you know, it will not be just, it's, it's actually 
definitely fair to claim that women um, are very active peace ambassadors and, and, and you know, they took on themselves, Ukrainian women took upon themselves the role of, um, um, you know, they, they engaged themselves in formal and informal uh, peace politics. If you look around uh, Plateau Tele on all international uh, channels, majority of speakers for Ukrainian case will be women. Um, women, well, there are Ukrainian journalists, Ukrainian activists. Um, the first lady of Ukraine, of course, uh, Olena Zelenska. All those women became um, wartime ambassadors of Ukraine. They took on the stages, the biggest and the smallest political stages around the world, pleading not for, for the end of fighting. They all plead for more weapon. They all plead for more um, military aid for Ukraine. And I think this is really different. This is what makes, makes the participation of Ukrainian women and the role of Ukrainian women in this war very different from many other conflicts we've seen. You know, even here, well, the recent example, um, even one day before the Hamas's um, pogrom in Israel's kibbutz, there was a large peace demonstration uh, led by Palestinian and Israeli women with appeal to stop fighting, to stop violence on both sides. We also will allow me a little bit of irony here to bring an example of Russian mothers during Chechen war who also had the very same appeal and did, this did not happen during uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, we also heard such appeal of, um, to, to lay down the arms regarding Ukraine's war, but they came from non-Ukrainian women's organizations. The International Women's Alliance made such a call. Of course, the whole campaign by, well, a feminist icon, Alice Schwarzer, right, um, against the military aid for Ukraine was quite noticeable and to my taste, very irritating. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, this, was, this appeal came regarding Ukraine's conflict, but from non-Ukrainian actors, from non-Ukrainian women's organization. And I think that this deserves a lot of attention because this will bring us back to the whole nature of this conflict. And this will bring us back to, to the whole nature of the conflict because I think that still, very often we, we witness how um, it's still not understood or well, rather intentionally misinterpreted as a part of information war, which is another front um, of this war. Um, and well, allow me to a little bit of criticism. I think Austria did not do a great job. Um, the thing is that there is a lot of a lot of interpretations, a lot of arguments about what provoked this war, as if it was a provoked, um, you know, and where it comes from and what Ukraine had to do, not so that it, as if responsibility for this war is on Ukraine. While for Ukrainian society, for Ukrainian women, once again, I emphasize on all, you know, almost consensual appeal of Ukrainian society for military defense. So Ukrainian women are peace actors, but they all understand and plead that the path towards peace is a military path. Um, it brings us all to the nature of this conflict once again, that misunderstood, as I said, because it is a matter of survival of the whole nation without any exaggeration. Um, it, is a, it is an act of aggression, an unprovoked, a criminal act of aggression against the nation. And if you study very carefully the rhetoric uh, that comes from Moscow, that comes from Kremlin during these um, two years, it becomes very clear that it's a neo-imperial war with a very colonial uh, logic, with a very colonial rhetoric. Um, and Ukrainians understand it better than anyone, right? And that is why you will not find any trace of uh, um, this example, or you will never find an example in Ukraine of women pushing to lay down the arms. Because once again, the matter here is the survival of the whole nation. 
And I think that this is a very important um, aspect here in the women's participation, women's role in the conflict in Ukraine, because, you know, it's this, this defense um, that, and the resistance, the ongoing resistance of Ukrainian society, despite the fact that, well, let's be honest, the prospects of victory are quite uh, small. Um, and maybe fellow Ukrainians will not like to hear that, but um, realistically, as of today, the prospects of Ukrainians' victory is, are very small. But the alternative for all Ukrainians is the destruction of the state and the exposure of the population and bigger share of population than it is today to constant violence under Russian occupation, as we see, to constant destruction, constant oppression. So it is, once again, without exaggeration, a battle for you know, Ukraine in a very, you know, I. I was, a, I was a, an active actor of Ukrainian society more than 10 years ago. In that time, Ukraine was, Ukrainian society was still rather divided about where to go, which path to take. And my act um, of protest and, and political engagement you know, for democracy and freedom and sort of Western-looking uh, Western perspective was, if not popular, but not consensual. And in a remarkable twist, today, Ukrainian society almost consensually understands that they need to fight, and there is no way to find a, to find a, you know, a path together with Russia. And I think, once again, this is something that is still too often misunderstood from here. And people, you know, these women in civil society, Ukrainian civil society, put many for actors in the West in a very uncomfortable position. You know, everybody wants here peace. They want the end of fighting. While for Ukrainians, peace means fighting for as long as possible to save as much as possible of Ukraine and Ukrainian nation. Yeah, thank you. And I just, <laughs> thank you. Just the last, to, to sum up, that indeed what happened is that I think Ukrainian women became this um, not anticipated challenge for Vladimir Putin in this war where indeed um, high morale and solidarity became an, another defense front. And I will even dare to argue that not thinking about it and not understanding this about Ukrainian society was one of his biggest mistakes as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thank you for, for giving us this insight and also the comparison to what women are, are thinking there and maybe here. And uh, it certainly will raise a lot of questions afterwards. So um, thank you for, for, for your statement. So, um, um, Tetiana, <coughs> how from the UN, how do you see the situation and what uh, is your work in contributing to peace, to women's rights, and what can you do? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. It's a great pleasure and honor, not only to share Ukrainians' experience, what they do in terms of gender equality and women's leadership, but also to learn from all of you because I think there are a lot of interesting ideas and experiences in this room which we can share and exchange. If the organizers allow, I would like to start with a very short video. Can you please turn it on? Short video, please, yes.
seen this video for many times, but it still triggers certain emotions. Mm -hmm. The data which you've seen in this video, actually it was made several months ago. However, the data there, they still remain relevant. We still have 6 million internally displaced people. 68% of them are women with children. We have over 6 million people who fled to neighboring countries. 90% of them are women with children. The war has caused the largest refugee crisis since the Second World War, displacing millions, killing millions and thousands, destroying the economy. It has caused tremendous destruction to the economy, turned our farmlands and forests into deadly minefields. You know that Ukraine is one of the biggest minefields globally now. According to the statistics of the Ministry of Health of Ukraine, 50% of Ukrainian families are separated, 90% of Ukrainians are exposed to the high risk of PTSD and chronic stress. The whole generation of children has been traumatized. And we know that half of all the population of children in Ukraine has left the country. The Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine, appointed by the Human Rights Council, recorded that the Russian military troops have committed a wide range of war crimes and violation of human rights. Willful killing, forced displacement, torture, rape, conflict-related sexual violence, as well as banning Ukrainian language and culture. This is all happening on the occupied territories, as the colleagues were mentioning, but it's also happening on the liberated and on the territories and on the front lines. It's a well-known fact that war has a disproportionate effect on women, and my colleagues were already talking about it. We see it in our work every day. And today I would like to talk more about women's leadership because that's exactly what we are dealing with in our work as UN Women, as a UN agency. In early 2022, when the government and many of the international agencies were not yet operational or left the country, these were the ordinary women who started to do extraordinary things. The women and women's civil societies, and I appreciate very much what the ambassador has mentioned at the beginning, when he said that these are the civil societies who are called to make the things sustainable. In Ukraine, these were the women civil societies who became our eyes, our ears, and our hands. They were the ones, these ordinary women, and again, I'm talking mostly about women because this is the mandate of the organization I represent. They were the ones who, despite the missile attacks, they reached out to the occupied territories, they were evacuating people, they were delivering humanitarian assistance, water, food, medication. They tried to keep on with the lessons and school classes for children in the shelters and that they have destroyed schools. They became our first partners in the first weeks of the war in 2022. I think I will not mention all of the challenges which Ukrainian women are facing. Again, the colleagues have mentioned some of them, and I don't think they are unique for Ukraine, because as I mentioned, the war exacerbates the existing gender inequalities, and we've seen and observed it in Ukraine. We've done a number of research, rapid gender assessments, which demonstrated in the first weeks and months of the war that women are more affected or differently affected by the war than the male population, for many reasons. Women lost their houses, their jobs, the level of increased, the level of unpaid care work has increased tremendously. What we observe now in Ukraine is the feminization of poverty. The level of poverty among women, especially single women, displaced women, those who are at the front lines in the conflict areas is growing tremendously. Women have to work, but they have no one to leave their kids with. Their husbands, fathers, brothers, sisters has been taken to the military. Many are killed or disappeared. Our assessment showed that the women's leadership, and again, I'm referring to the assessment because we as UN Women are monitoring the situation quite closely. We invest a lot of time and efforts into, and resources into monitoring and keeping the data up on track. 
So our assessment showed that women's leadership at the family and community level has increased. Women say that when it comes to making decisions in the families or in the communities on humanitarian or conflict response, they are the ones who participate equally. However, when it comes to formal political and administrative decision making, women's participation and representation is decreasing. We observe that in the time of the war, the issues of gender equality and social development tend to be sidelined. And of course, the voices of women are not included meaningfully in the humanitarian response and also in the participation at the higher decision-making levels. Decisions are often made quickly and do not often adequately reflect the differentiated needs of men and women. What we also observe is the centralization of power and the increased role of the military. Colleagues already mentioned today that we have 60,000 women now in the military. 43,000 are in the armed forces of Ukraine and around 5,000 are at the active war areas, which if I'm not mistaken is the highest percentage among the NATO countries. And we still keep on talking about militarization of society when whenever it comes to the high level decision making, these are mostly men. And men in the audience, please do not get me wrong, it's not against men, it's about equal participation. The risk is, and we've seen it in under, after the Second World War in many countries, that when the world goes back to kind of normal life, when the war ends, then the women, although they were in the informal decision making, they pushed back to traditional gender roles and society roles. And this is something we want to prevent in Ukraine, because we already observed this tendency, you know, in the liberated areas, when during the occupation, these were women who stayed and who tried to deliver the services. But once the life more or less coming back to normal, the women are pushed back. And this is one of the priorities for us as the UN agency, as a specialized UN agency, which is working on women's rights and gender equality, to make sure that women are equally represented at all levels of decision-making and participation. Um, I think that as tragic as this war is, it provides an excellent opportunity for women to demonstrate their leadership. And I think that during this war and after this war, the Ukrainian women, they don't have to prove anymore to anyone else that they can be in the leadership positions and in the full participation. The war offers an opportunity to fast track EU and maybe your Atlantic integration, but I think what is more important for Ukrainians and Ukrainian women specifically, that they are fighting for this set of values such as human rights, democracy, and rule of law. What Ukrainians are trying, and Ukrainian women, what they are trying to prove to everyone that these values are not fake. And this is exactly what we are trying to support in Ukraine as, as the UN women. Last week we had a Ukrainian women, the seventh actually, Ukrainian Women Congress, which is a big dialogue platform for women to get together, politicians, experts, gender experts, grassroots women from the communities to come together and discuss gender-related issues. There was one panelist, a woman named Svetlana, she is from Chernigiv region, which is in the north of Ukraine, north to the Kiev, which was occupied last year. Her community was occupied by Russian troops in 2022. Out of 4,000 buildings in the village, and she's the head of the community, she's basically the leader of the community. Out of 4,000 buildings, 3,000 were destroyed. Many people left, many people were killed, tortured and raped. She decided to stay, although she had her family, and she decided to stay in this half-destroyed community. And she was sharing this story, I was listening to her. And then when the village was liberated, she immediately started to fundraise to renovate the buildings. Because if people have buildings, they will consider returning back to the community. Then she started to fundraise for a school building, because if there is a school in the village, women with children might consider coming back. And when she was asked why she didn't leave, especially for the time of the occupation, she told me, but if it's not me, then who? And for me, this is a great example of women's leadership. 
which is the key to Ukraine's victory and Ukraine's recovery. So this is my key message today, I think, that women do not have to prove to anyone that they can lead, that they can be leaders, because they are already. And Ukraine's case, and colleagues again were sharing different examples of women's approaches towards leadership and their approaches towards resolving this war. Yes, Ukrainian women don't talk about peace in many cases. They talk about weapon and fighting, because peace, in many ways, it's not occupation. Occupation is not peace. Peace is victory. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your contributions, for your moving contributions. Um, there, um, we, well, we think, um, we have to talk about where, what we can do to support the women's movement. We see that women are very, very important in that crisis, and, uh, and we have to um, see that um, this kind of setback uh, in, in these times of war of, um, of uh, women's rights doesn't have to become a norm after the war. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you before we start uh, and, uh, and open the floor for the audience to ask questions is, um, do you think, uh, you talked about um, the, the, the war crimes, and do you think that um, gender-based crimes do have to get the same attention as other war crimes, and uh, especially uh, do they get the same resources um, to to um, investigate those sources? Do you think, do you know about that? Or are you, uh, you well, trying I, to I, investigate you know, there were, yourself? Well, when the first, the first testimonies and the first um, facts about rape started coming out, um, Ukrainians, um, including some public figures in Ukraine, um, notably, for example, Masha Yefrasinina, who is a, very, who is a, a TV host, uh, um, right away started initiatives and fun foundations that would finance and support um, collection of these testimonies and, of course, provide psychological support uh, to the victims. Many of those victims, of course, um, struggle to testify and want to testify also anonymously because we should also be honest that Ukraine um, was, you know, prior to the full-scale invasion, um, there was still a lot of work had to be done um, in, um, you know, the, the, the rape is stigmatized in, in almost all societies and in Ukraine that was also um, a case, and you know, speaking about gender-based violence, um, you know, Ukraine was doing quite good steps, um, moving onto this path, but it was just the beginning, um, really. So uh, there are initiatives within Ukraine from Ukrainian society where um, where you know people understand that they need to record those crimes right now, uh, for once again um, later attempts to get at least some share of, of justice. Um, and of course, um, the, the number of those testimonies and number of those um, crimes, of course, drew attention of International Criminal Court, which also investigators are there and recording those crimes, which once again, as I said, we have enough reason to treat those crimes as a separate strategy as a separate strategy of aggression used by the aggressor, by Russia, against Ukraine. So uh, those crimes definitely, you know, uh, sexual, sexual uh, crimes should not be considered and treated in this war in particular among the crimes, or you know, as we are used to hearing um, something like that's a that's a sort of a thing that always happens, because once again here we see a systematic usage of sexual uh, violence 
here and very often those, if you, if you go through those painful testimonies, you would see that very often victims uh, testify w what the aggressor was saying to them while they were committing sexual crimes. And very often it is um, the, 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 the rapist, the, the uh, Russian soldiers would say, I'm raping you so that you don't give birth to more Ukrainians. So there is once again this rhetoric and narrative that is, you know, the, of this neo-imperial um, uh, war-mongering army that came to once again destroy Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And I think once again this is something that many in the West are running away from. We don't want to deal with this very complex and very difficult nature of this conflict. Uh, it's much easier to say that Ukraine provoked Russia because it wanted to join NATO than to deal with the imperial, neo-imperialism of the whole Russian society. But we will not be able to run away from it because the number of those crimes and the number of those testimonies already recorded and there will be more hopefully when other Ukrainian territories will be liberated because as we speak, so many Ukrainians, Ukrainian women and children are under occupation. And at this, as we are speaking right now, many of them experience similar crimes. So this will definitely have to be treated as a, as a separate group of crimes because they're systematic and they're on a large scale. They okay. are the strategy of aggression. Yes, thank you. Um, now, thank you to the audience. Are there questions? Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, to all the panelists, also in my position as the director of the AIS for coming all the way and for joining this very important session today for your indeed very moving and extremely important insights that you shared here with us tonight. Um, I have one concrete question to all three panelists. Um, I would be very interested to hear your recommendations, your perspectives that you would like to give to policymakers here in Europe, since we're based in Vienna, um, especially to male policymakers, how they can also understand their role in supporting women in conflict zones better, and what especially these male policymakers uh, can or should do in your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, can I ask first uh, for yes. this question? Yes, please. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, my answer will be that uh, um, uh, you should look uh, for uh, means, not only what to do in conflict zones, but also what to do inside your own countries. Because uh, have in mind, uh, are you, your, are your countries are prepared enough for wars or for some other types of catastrophes because we live in very unpredicted uh, situation now and everything can happen and maybe in the countries that are under the NATO umbrella or surrounded by NATO like Austria is so maybe the direct war conflict uh, is not on the table but uh, remember COVID Think about other types of catastrophes. Think about uh, you know using atomic weapons by Russia against Ukraine, and it will be on your border. And in all of these cases, the national security should be like really very well developed. And is it really developed enough in your countries as well? And uh, um, for that, I emphasize this comprehensive defense paradigm because it's uh, seductive to say that, okay, we, we do not predict a war, that's why we are not interested in uh, military defense, but there are other threats and propaganda, Russian propaganda is very huge threat, um, bribing by Russian money of economic and political elites in Europe are also a huge threat. And all the threats should be mentioned and there should be some counteracting 
towards that threat and uh, comprehensive defense paradigm is a good answer because it allows to include civil society, business, uh, CCOs, uh, other agents, and first of all, to include women into what should be done. And my answer to your question is, so build your own comprehensive defense systems inside your country, collaborate with other countries, and then you will have a very good strategy to use in conflict zones as well and to help countries like Ukraine, because we can coordinate here and we can bring our experience, you can bring your experience, and it will be like much better defense, educated defense than it is now. Thank you very much. I can, yes, I can maybe quickly add to the responding to your question. As I mentioned in my intervention, I think this war is much broader than the war between Ukraine and Russia only. This is the, I think the whole globe is at the cost of certain historical movements. All this set of values and regulations which Europe has been preaching and talking about for decades, such as rule of law, justice, human rights, are at stake now. And what Ukraine is fighting for, as I said, is to prove that these values are not fake. Ukraine cannot win this battle alone because this is not only about Ukraine or Ukrainian women. This is about the rule of law in the whole world. And if the rule of law doesn't work now, and that's what we hear from our women's human rights defenders when we talk to them, when we interact with them, they say, the rule of law doesn't work. Only weapon, only physical strength matters. So if the rule of law and human rights values do not prevail now, then the whole world is at stake. Because we don't know, or we, we might imagine, what will matter and what will win. So this is the task for all countries, not only Ukraine, not only in Europe, but also beyond Europe. Yes, if only to support what was just said, you know, it's very interesting how three of us, we have, we come from a very different experience, we speak from a very different perspectives, but the three of us, we share the feeling that as if nobody uh, beyond Ukraine understands what's, what's happening and how big is the threat. And I think that now two years in, um, as, as the war is approaching, it's two years, um, one could say that Vladimir Putin indeed, well, we, all, we had a world order, imperfect, definitely, but we had a world order. Today we are facing a disorder, a world disorder. We see how international institutions failed to restrain the aggressor, which was until Russia's invasion of Ukraine was imaginary, right? We had, so, we have, we, we had such a uh, security architecture that we thought when the moment will come, it will, it will work, it will function, it will protect us, because otherwise in peacetime we could never uh, measure how effective these institutions. Today we, we see how actually we were not prepared. Um, Vladimir Putin indeed opened a window, a very large, large door for anyone in the world who is ready to start a conflict, to start another war. Because two years of fighting, we've seen that you can breach international norms. You can uh, target civilian population, mostly. That will be your primary target. You can rape, you can commit war crimes at the, and pay a very small price have a very little consequence. And I think that we can expect more of such conflicts er you know, erupting here and there, and we already see that. And you know, I think that what we are also witnessing, and we should be, we should be honest with ourselves, Vladimir Putin is leading, forming a, a formidable authoritarian force. They welcomed in Moscow Taliban. After the 7th October, they welcomed leaders of Hamas in Moscow. We have, to, we have to look clearly and not you know, forget about Russia that we thought 
we were working with, you know, and signing all those contracts with Vladimir Putin. We were just buying time. We had to see at what's happening today. And indeed, I think, as it was said, look at what you're doing in your own countries. And my main advice is understand the happiness that you have and enjoy and protect it as much as possible. Because indeed, the, the aggressor is there and the aggressor is committed for a constant expanding war. It is, once as it was said, it was not a matter of Ukraine. It is a matter of all democratic world. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question, and then I think, is, is, are there more than these questions? No, then after that we have to finish the first panel. Thank you so much. I'm deeply moved and, and feel with you and your brave um, war against the war. Um, I understand what you feel because I was born in one of the countries that uh, was under Russian uh, suppression of the World War II. So uh, what I see now is actually what we have um, felt, what we have read in the history books or thought that it was, you know, way back and we have left that, but it came back. And the patterns, uh, what you see, what you um, see every day in Ukraine, the patterns of the war are the same that have been before. Uh, that's a very personal comment. And the question is, uh, what happened to the children, thousands of children that were taken away from Ukraine and are now in, in Russia? Can you comment on that? Thank you. Um, I will try. As a UN woman, uh, we are not mandated to record, track, monitor, and record human rights violations. So unfortunately, I'm not in the right position to respond to your question with specific data and evidence. There are obviously UN agencies which are mandated to track and to record, and of course there are human rights institutions in Ukraine, like ombudspersons and human rights commissioner, but uh, who are dealing with these issues. I don't have the official data, but I have to acknowledge that even the data which is available on the kids and the children uh, who were forced or forcedly deported to the, to the Russian Federation, is not accurate because the real data is, is not available, especially when it comes to the occupied territories. So unfortunately, I cannot give you, as I said, the numbers. I know that the Ukrainian government, including the Ombudsperson's office, they are working very actively to the extent possible to bring the children back. And almost every week I can see in the news the lines that two Children were brought back. Five children were returned to, the, to Ukraine with their families, or united with their families. So these are small numbers, but they show that some work isn't going. However, the real situation, how many children were taken, how many children were officially returned, is not public and is not available. So the certain work is ongoing, and of course, a certain percentage of the territory of Ukraine is still occupied. We don't have access there. We as UN, we don't work in the occupied territories. We don't know what's really happening there. But this is a big issue, and I know that the Ukrainian government is working hardly to bring the people, especially the children, back. Mm -hmm. Maybe, colleagues, you have more insights from the civil society, because as I said, sometimes civil society have more access and more knowledge, even when compared to the government or to the development organizations. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Um, there is a question, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the moving panel discussion. Um, I wanted to ask whether you could reflect maybe a little bit on the martial law itself and how that has impacted women, especially in Ukraine regarding, and also regarding other martial laws, like for example the German one or the Slovenian one, where we have very strong um, gender definitions still in place. Yes. 
two weeks do you yeah, want to to start it, that's her expertise <laughs> <laughs> i can then add but maybe yeah who wants to no. know <laughs> difficult question no yes it's it's a difficult question um the martial law has many implications uh, in different areas of life legal economical personal as you know, and I know, I don't remember whether I mentioned, but 50% um, of the Ukrainian families are separated now, partially because of the martial law, because men are not allowed to leave the country, they cannot cross the border. I know that you know, according to the Ukrainian regulations, these are the men who are called to the military. However, uh, Ukrainian women, they are not mandated to go. However, certain list of professions, they have to now, based on the martial law, register, such as nurses, and there is a number of others, I cannot list all of them. They have to officially register, and they have to be prepared to be called to the military if necessary. I haven't heard about such cases yet. All these 60,000 of women, which I mentioned, which are in the military, they are, they are volunteered. They went to the army and they went to the military on a voluntary basis. And luckily, uh, three years ago, it was three, yeah, almost, almost three years ago, even more than that, the Ukrainian, there was a legislation in, Ukrainian, in Ukraine which banned Ukrainian women from occupying almost 400 professions, including in the military. So if a woman would come as a sniper, she was not allowed to officially register as a sniper. She would be registered as a nurse, as a cleaner, or as a cook, mm -hmm. receiving the respective salary and benefits, which are very limited as compared to the high-level officers' positions or generals. And there are a number of other professions which were banned. Luckily now, this, this legislation is lifted and Ukrainian women have no limitation in choosing their occupational profession. And that's one of the factors, I think, which contributed to the increased number of women in the military. When they are now officially allowed to take high rank positions, we have several women generals in Ukrainian armed forces now. It doesn't mean that there are no gender stereotypes. There are a lot of gender stereotypes. And again, last week I was talking to one of the women. She came, um, she's a sniper, by the way. And she came to the, whatever it's called, like the military, the army brigade, and there were only men. And when they saw her, they, they thought, immediately thought, that she is a nurse. They didn't even imagine that she is a sniper. So there are a lot of gender stereotypes women are still confronted with in Ukraine, especially in the armed forces. Um, but coming back to your question on the martial law, there are a lot of implications, of course, but uh, it's hard for me to compare with the martial law in other countries which you listed. I'm not that familiar with the legislation in, in the countries you mentioned. In Ukraine, yes, there are implications. And, I can see them even like in everyday life, but I guess this is the reality. You cannot be in the war without certain limitations in terms of martial laws. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think this um, discussion is very important um, for to get uh, information from first hand. And directly, I think, uh, when I look into the audience, I think we all are moved, but also impressed by the braveness and the courage and the engagement of Ukraine women. And um, I want to thank you very much for participating in the discussion. And, um, and I wish you all the best, you. and for your country and the women in Ukraine and the population there. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, um, welcome back now to the second panel. Um, again, with excellent panelists. Um, I'm very pleased um, to have you here. Um, Anna Hess Zag Sia, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us. 
She is um, the head, uh, she is a Swiss Armenian expert on conflict resolution, especially in the Middle East and Eurasia. Um, the head of conflict uh, resolution uh, in the Austria Center for Peace in Schleining. Um, and has extensive experience in peace and conflict studies and peace mediation. Over the course of her career, Anna has designed and supported a number of formal and informal peace processes, as well as develop educational programs in the field of peace and conflict studies. Um, there are a lot of publications also, uh, and the research is focused on the impact of geopolitical tensions on the settlement of protracted conflicts particularly in the OSCE area. And then um, we are pleased to have with us uh, Victoria Fontaine, Fontaine? All right. uh, a professor of peace and conflict studies and provost of the American University of Afghanistan. So um, the stress is on that area. But she is uh, also teaching a current uh, visiting professor at, um, at uh, institutes and universities in Mexico, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as in Iraq. And um, coming from Doha, you, uh, Qatar, sorry from Qatar, um, you had a long way to come to here, and uh, from the heat to the cold, maybe. <laughs> so we are very, very happy that you are with us. Um, Victoria is also the coordinator for HPASS, the uh, LinkedIn-type platform for humanitarian workers and volunteers. And her area uh, of speciali specialization is uh, critical terrorism studies from, peace, from a peace studies perspective, um, but also the open recogni recognition networks to build sustainable peace, sustainable peace. So thank you very much uh, to you both uh, for being here. Um, we have um, this second um, panel is on women, peace, and gender justice. So uh, there is certainly quite a lot to do on that if you look at it globally. But um, very often you don't have to go as far as that. You can look at Austria sometimes too. So. Um, Policy making in general and foreign policy uh, and especially security uh, policy in particular is still something like a male domain and associated with men and very often it excludes women. So what is your insight, what is your work to help women to get their justice? So, would you like to start, please? Sure. Yeah. Yes. If, uh, yeah. I think I'm on. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, well, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation from my side. Um, uh, grateful to colleagues for having me here and, and um, for our Ukrainian uh, colleagues for sharing your passionate and powerful story. Uh, not an easy shoe to jump into after that, um, that panel, uh, but we'll try. So, um, um, with all my um, empathy, uh, compassion, uh, and full understanding for what uh, the Ukrainian people are going through, um, I will zoom out now a bit of Ukraine and, and, and talk about um, what you asked me to talk about, um, mainly my experience, how we have been working with women uh, in peace processes at large, how do we encourage promote, support women's participation in peace processes, uh, what are the challenges, what are the strategies, and why do we do this, right? So I'll zoom out of Ukraine, but I have worked in Ukraine for about seven years um, on many levels in advisory consultancy roles to uh, ministries. Um, back then it was called reintegration of uh, temporarily occupied territories and IDPs. Um, I have worked with um, universities, 
setting up master's degrees in peace mediation, and, and I have lost some of my students there as well, male students. So I have worked a lot in Ukraine, and I'll be happy to talk about you know, common uh, interests and, and experiences at a m m later stage. But for now, okay, um, I mean, uh, what you uh, both especially touched upon, but also our, um, I think Tamara was her name, right? Um, a colleague um, online, you know, you touched on very key elements that I would like to bring in uh, during the, my, my input. But um, one thing that I want to just throw into the discussion here for all of us is like, you know, we love to talk about uh, women, the importance of women for, for, for decades a bit, right? Like more than two mm -hmm. decades, we have had all kinds of resolutions, all kinds of normative frameworks, uh, you know, talking about the importance of having women in peace processes. Now, why do we want that, right? It's not only a matter of right. I think I want to throw in this new sort of conversation, the concept into our conversation, which is the sustainability, right? It not only it's good to have women uh, in the peace processes because it's their human right, it's a matter of equality or, or equal access to decision making, but when it comes to peace processes, especially peace agreements, it's about sustainability. Right? So I think there is a lot of research uh, that shows that when women were given access to peace processes, those peace agreements, if implemented, they were more durable. So there is a lot of research on that one. I don't have to go into this, but I think this is the key, key goal, right? Like we, you know, we have been talking about sustainability of peace agreements to a large extent in the peace mediation field all the time. And there, this, this research is actually encouraging in a sense that, okay, uh, it's not just tokenism, it's not a good thing to have, right? Because women constitute half of the you know, world's population and in each society because it's important. And because of all the reasons that you mentioned, women bearing the brunt, but also having the right to be part of decision-making processes, but it's also sustainability. So that's the important thing. But I mean, having said that, then you know, when we talk today about the inclusion of women, um, I wanna ask the question inclusion into what? Because now I want to zoom out again from this issue as well a little bit more and look at the context, context within which peace processes are taking place or not taking place, right? So, we, you know, somebody said might is right. We have this, we're, we're a, ma a major fallback into the uh, mode of settling differences through war, right? Invasion has become the norm of the day. You can just use force, you can grab territory and you can get away with it. So. They're essentially, the peace mediation field is paralyzed right now. Mm. Some of us are going through professional existential crisis, right? So you have this, um, yes, uh, forgive me for being open, that's what it is. We have failed to settle you know, the, the conflict in Ukraine. We have failed to settle the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Syria has been going on forever. So, uh, yeah, clearly the liberal peace paradigm in which our peace mediation business is embedded is being challenged. And you already mentioned, right, uh, you know, so, some of the actors who are challenging. And by that, they're challenging also. Forgive me for saying this. This is not world order. It was the European security order. So, because the world has been, you know, in, in, in a disorder, I think, for times immemorial, and we in Europe, we were the lucky ones to have the 70 years of peace project, which is massively challenged now. So, I'm going to say it's the European security order that is being challenged by authoritarianism and authoritarian ways of dealing with conflicts. So, okay, so this is what's happening. And, and in the jargon, in the professional jargon, we say, okay, women are not at the table. Which table, right? So, there are not many tables. It's a battlefield. Right, so, um, and, 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 but that's, that's a question I want to, you know, you know, I want us to sort of um, yeah, think about. But having said that, for a while, we still had some tables, dysfunctional tables, but we still had those tables, and mostly women were not present, right? So if you look at statistics, forgive me, I don't remember how, like maybe 2020 statistics, but please check on this. Um, only 13% of negotiators were women, only 6% were mediators, huh? that's third party, and usually third parties are Western Europeans or North Americans. Huh? Um, and, and then only 6% were signatories of peace agreements. So 
quite low number, right? But it's not only about number, and here where I want to move then from inclusion to influence, because essentially it's not about the tick boxing that mm. you have women at the table, but what's the influence that they actually have? The influence on the agenda setting at the table, on the implementation back at home or wherever they're working, and then actually creating alliances among men that would support that agenda and the implementation of that agenda. So this has been happening, um, and I want to share some uh, lessons learned, if you will, uh, from our experience. Now, um, women's inclusion and hopefully influential inclusion happens, has, has been happening on many levels, right? There's a lot of effort, a lot of initiatives, a lot of conversations, normative frameworks geared towards this. So it happens on track one, what we call, sorry, official negotiation processes or official mediation. Then it happens on civil society level, um, and it happens at the larger grassroots level. Now, it's very interesting in Ukraine what, what what was fascinating, I mean, I've worked from Nepal, you know, all over Eurasia and, and, and a bit in Middle East when it comes to women's issues. And in Ukraine, what we had back in 2014, 80% of the peace builders back then and the uh, mediation community at large, uh, and, and let me highlight that Ukraine has had local mediation community for a long time. It's not a new thing, right? You know that dialogue facilitators and mediators. 80% they were women. So actually, they, for them, they were not, there was no need to talk about the you know, importance of having women. And when I was talking to them, they were like, we're not interested in being part of the official table because we don't believe in it. And, and then there was an interesting... Uh, I don't want to say dichotomy, but a bit of a, like an interesting conversation between then the Westerners or the third parties coming from outside saying, oh, you need women at the table, when we didn't have women from the OEC as much, right? So th there was an interesting tension dichotomy, and the women, women peace builders would say we're not interested in track one because we see clearly that it's not working. Having said that, there were women at the official table as well. Now... I want to come back quickly then again to the influence, but also one element that I want to bring in, which is um, very, um, it, it's a trap that we shouldn't fall into. And I think you mentioned that, uh, uh, Inna, right? When, when you were talking about the experiences about Ukrainian women being, you know, in all spheres of life, but also being pro-defense, right? The peace occupation is not peace. I mean, I think it's, it's a very powerful statement, but you define what's peace for you, right? And what, where, what you want to work for. But the fallacy that I wanted to mention or the trap is this reductionism that we tend to have that women are peaceful, right? So let's have more women so that we can have more peace. So that's one trap that we want to avoid in this discourse. And then the other trap is actually conflation of women with gender sensitivity. Because you can have a lot of women in many processes and they're not gender sensitive, A. Eh? They're not because they're just as power driven as men are because they have to function in male environments, right? Or whatever, that's their choice. But we tend to automatically put them into that box that, okay, you're a woman, you have to be gender sensitive and you have to bring in the gender relevant issues. Huh? So, and this has been my experience as well, when you know, a lot of women would have a reaction, actually. They was like, you know, don't put me in that box. I'm not interested in gender issues. I'm interested in hard security issues. I'm interested in transitional justice issues. So, and, and this, what I'm saying is from my experience and also basing on research, which we have called redefining peace leadership. And I will finish sort of my, my input with that, um, you know, sharing some insights from, from that research. So, um, you know, myself having worked in peace mediation, mostly with officials um, in, in many contexts, uh, myself and, and some colleagues from European Institute for Peace and Folke Bernatode Academy and US San Diego Croc Institute of Peace and Justice Studies, we decided to have a look at women negotiators and mediators' experiences together with them and to see what kind of strategies have they been using as negotiators and mediators and, and, and to learn from it, right? To, to understand, actually, does inclusion necessarily lead to effectiveness or influence? So it was a, um, a very interesting and a fascinating get-together of female negotiators from all over the world, from Colombia to Guatemala to... to uh, Afghanistan, we didn't have anyone, sorry, but to, to Israel and to Middle East, uh, and negotiated separately, mediators, and then we brought them together and we had conversations. And we actually, as, as sort of the leaders of this initiative, we specifically avoided framing the whole conversation from the gender angle. 
We just ask them as professionals, how did you do, you know, how did you deal with your conflict parties? What kind of issues did you decide upon, etc.? What kind of strategies do you use? Uh, and we did this on purpose to see whether this gender element is actually there or do we have to tease it out. It was fascinating what came out, and I will not bore you with all the details uh, of the, or, or, or um, with all the findings, but I wanna what I want to share with you is this gender sensitive bit. Mm. And um, it was fascinating to see that across the board, women from all of the cultural contexts, they did come up with one way or another, in one way or another, with gender relevant issues. Either matter of style, either matter of content, their gendered experiences or how the gender stereotypes were actually used against them, etc. So it was a fascinating um, um, you know, um, discussion and exchange and the findings, but what was important to see that again, not to have this reductionism or essentially essentializing women's role at the table, because what I just referred to a little bit uh, a while ago is, um, you know, you, you had women that dealt with the gender issues because they were really committed to it in many creative ways. You had women, both negotiators and mediators, who absolutely didn't care for gender-related issues or women's issues. Some of the issues that you mentioned that you know, are happening right now were not brought into the official discussions by men because mostly they were oblivious to these issues, or by women because at e, uh, a, they were either um, sort of ashamed, stigma, and etc., or they actually didn't think it's a you know matter of hard security, so it was actually left aside. And then there, you know, there was also very interesting to see that when you look at women's participation, their mandate and political affiliation matters as well. So we had women ex-combatants who were sitting at the table, and their mandate clearly was from was from the rebel group. And the rebel group didn't tell her, you know, deal with the, you know, gender-based violence, for example. So she didn't push it on the on the agenda, even though she wanted to, but it was not part of her agenda. So mandate, political affiliation, your own personal experiences, your own personality matters a lot, whether you are actually gender sensitive, uh, you know, or bringing in gender sensitive or women related issues to the table. And, and that's also an important um, aspect um, to, to consider. I want to finish my input with what we came up with. So we realized actually there is no one way of doing business, right? There's no one way of doing mediation or negotiation. Uh, that would be peculiar to women because we are a heterogeneous group, right? Massively heterogeneous group. Uh, and, and that is important, but what we realized is there is a way of doing mediation, negotiation. I mean, I'm highlighting mediation, negotiation because that's where I come from, but essentially any type of business I would imagine, that there's a, it's, it's, the, it's the nature of the leadership that matters and women's leadership, and I want to come now finish the conversation here, that there is, we should redefine actually leadership at large, but we should also redefine women's leadership and peace leadership. And, and this style of leadership is basically not the coercive, right? The classical, uh, you know, you know I, I don't use these concepts lightly, but the patriarchal way or the macho way of leading, the coercive way, from moving away from the coercive way of leading to more integrative, what we called, uh, you know, the style power over versus moving over from power over to power with, right? So more transformative and integrative type of leadership, and that can be exercised by men and women alike, right? Mm. So I would like to finish with that, and I'm um, happy to take any answers, any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, to, to learn from you and to hear uh, the outcome of, um, of, of this uh, uh, research you were doing and uh, trying to bring uh, women together and find out how the how how is the way how, what what kind of way is it they are negotiating and how are they doing it? Um, do you do you have similar findings? What is your your um, how how do you find uh, um, the way women try to get? Uh, gender justice, how are they fighting for it? You are in so many different countries, uh, teaching there as well and uh, talking to people, finding out, uh, doing research probably. So what is, is the outcome of your work? 
Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you for your invitation and for this uh, very important uh, panel. Um, fr from my perspective, uh, and I'll draw uh, on the lessons of Afghanistan um, uh, before, uh, during the, um, which was not the peace process, it was a withdrawal uh, a negotiation and, uh, and now. Um, and, and for me, you know, within this uh, framework, gender justice has been something that has been claimed and seized upon and that continues to be, um, uh, to be worked towards every day. So it's not something, you know, it was really interesting what you said earlier because we, we keep talking about uh, women being given access to the negotiation table or, you know, staying within civil society and, uh, and empowering one another, uh, you know, from a civil society perspective. But eventually it's about claiming this access and about breaking the door and getting, and getting through that door. Mm -hmm. And for Afghanistan, it's been, um, uh, it's been something recurrent over time. And, and I think that the, the, the failure of this um, withdrawal agreement that took place between, um, um, between the United States and, um, and the Taliban has been that women haven't um, reclaimed their uh, power uh, enough. So, so I'm, I'm going to focus, it's great that you focused on peace, I'm gonna focus um, on gender justice and, um, and from the perspective of the, I'm, I'm zooming, no, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm zooming into uh, the, the perspective of our university because we are fighting for this justice every mm -hmm. day. And I think it's really important. I wish um, I wish an Afghan woman was was speaking instead of me today. Um, and uh, and I can only reflect. I mean, I'd like to start with that um, as um, um, as the the Republic uh, of Afghanistan fell very quickly. And and it was mentioned earlier, we didn't plan. We were uh, thinking of many different scenarios. But while we thought we had months, we only had days, and 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 the you know the change uh, in um, in leadership, and this change of paradigm happened so quickly um, that you know I don't think we could ever have been prepared. But as it happened, and as I was with our students, I was um, um, I was the last one to have the privilege to be able to leave um, uh, after the um, after the leadership changed in Kabul, and I saw my my female students leave their worst nightmare, and they knew that you know they were I mean the country was was going to close its doors. They didn't know what the future was going to be for them, but they were, re they were leaving the times that they had only heard about from their family members, their mothers, you know, from the 1990s. And, and as those, um, those days occurred, and I had this privilege to leave, and they were, you know, many of them were stuck there. They're all out, but, uh, but at the time, we didn't know how or, or, or when that would happen. Um, I could see that somehow, you know, they um, they knew that they could only rely on themselves to uh, to to build uh, this gender justice amidst, you know, this um, um, amidst this chaos uh, that was the um, that was the, the the fall of Afghanistan then, and so I think that you know, for us as we reflect on the ongoing war in Ukraine and, and the situation, the political situation in Afghanistan, we see that um, uh, understanding the role of women is not just a matter of gender equality, it's essential for a comprehensive understanding of the conflict dynamics um, uh, and for the, f for the formulation of effective peace strategies. And that's really important because gender justice plays um, um, a pivotal role in the pursuit of sustainable peace has been mentioned. And what do we mean by gender justice? Um, and, and for me, you know, number one, I was thinking about it, you know, on my way here, um, gender, gender justice is, you know, when you're facing a totalitarian state um, um, that is, um, that, that is perpetrating gender apartheid um, on a daily basis 
and when this apartheid is like you know it's like you you are you, you you are stuck and the walls around you are kind of getting closer and closer every day towards you what does it mean and um and you know we we usually say there is no peace without justice and we are far away from peace right now mm -hmm. because the lives that our students live um every day in kabul um is um, you know within four walls the only window that they have, um, uh, the, the, the only thing they can, they can look forward to on a daily basis is to open their computer and, and be in a classroom with, um, with their peers um, uh, globally. That's the only thing they can look forward to. So this works? When they have electricity, of uh -huh. course, I'm going to get to that, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, um, so what's important is that, you know, as we talk about gender justice, the act of opening your computer and studying online means that you are uh, you are claiming that you 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 are redefining what this gender justice means, and here that's something really important because at the moment um, Afghan women are are stuck within walls in their physical walls in their houses, but also stuck in this conflict between the international community uh, in all its grandeur and its democratic values and the Taliban. And somehow both of those entities are speaking for Afghan women and are deciding what Afghan women's reality is. And so, and, and, are, and are speaking for them. You know, I'm here for your justice, for your democracy, etc. But at the end of the day, um, what's really important to realize when you are a woman studying in Afghanistan and when you are an NGO supporting women in Afghanistan, out of, um, out of the, the, the humanitarian endeavor uh, to, to, to exercise the right to education and access to quality education. You're stuck between those two different, those two entities one of them saying, oh, uh, we don't want to do anything in Afghanistan because this would recognize um, the Taliban regime and we don't want to do that. While at the same time, we don't want women to study or we want to exercise um, our power over women so that we can negotiate other things with the international community and we want to be recognized. So maybe, you know, if we, if we again use women as a point of negotiation, then we'll be able to get something as a state and be recognized. What's really important to remember is that when, when a woman turns her computer on in the morning and decides to study, she is not only prevented by the Taliban to study, but also by the international community, because they have decided that nobody should do anything in Afghanistan. And that by doing anything in Afghanistan, it will recognize the Taliban. No, there is a difference between engagement and between recognition. And until we realize that, we are actually further victimizing Afghan women and the populations that are vulnerable in Afghanistan today. And that's extremely important because eventually it's not just us as an, as an academic institution, but it is all the NGOs that are working in Afghanistan today. And it's very possible to work and to help populations without recognizing a regime, because at the end of the day, this is not our business. We are in the humanitarian sector, okay? And I consider uh, education and, um, and, the, and the provision of quality education as uh, a humanitarian endeavor. So, you know, as I'm reflecting on, I was reflecting on gender justice, I still wrote something because I thought it's always much better to be eloquent. So I'll, I'll read you, you know, two little paragraphs. True gender justice cannot and should not emanate from the oppressor. And here I mentioned two oppressors of Afghan women today, okay? Um, so it is unrealistic to believe that those who benefit from the existing power structures can or, willingly, or will willingly dismantle them. The relinquishing of power by the oppressor is an illusion a facade that often maintains the status quo under the guise of progress. Again, two, of, two oppressors. 
Gender justice demands a radical restructuring of our societal fabric, one that transcends male privilege and ingrains equity at its core. So its goal is not merely to create spaces within existing structures for marginalized voices, but to redefine these structures altogether. And that's important. So then I went on to, I looked at, I was with the United Nations for nine years, so I know how it works and how it doesn't work. And uh, so I went in and I Googled gender justice in the uh, UN and also OSCE because I was with the OSCE as well. So UN Women, it's all about um, U UNDP gender equality strategy, 22-25. We open country offices. We have gender responsive um, uh, officers, etc. We um, provide awards as well. The OSCE provides uh, the... Uh, has a program for gender uh, issue that provides tools and guidelines. That's the Gender Champion Award. There are so many strategies out there, but at the end of the day, none of those strategies help my students, and that's the problem, my female students. So let us be unequivocally clear. The path to gender justice will not be paved by yet another commission or program, nor will it be achieved through awards or reports that often serve as male, male placeholders for genuine action. It requires commitment and resolve to confront and dismantle the deeply engraved prejudices and biases that perpetuate inequality, both in war and peace. And here is the, the, the important point for me uh, today. We, um, as you know, um, um, workers from on the periphery can use our privilege and our resources to carve a space for women within their own societies to have agency and to decide what their gender justice is. And it's really important for women in Afghanistan in, and, and I'm not talking about Afghan women, I'm talking about women in Afghanistan who stayed in Afghanistan and who are fighting for their own, to create uh, their own reality on a daily basis. And I'm saying that we need to support them and not judge them in relation to what they do. They are the ones surviving on the ground. Very often the diasporas are really quick to decide for other women what they should or should not do. I'll give you one example. Mabouba Seraj, she was nominated to be uh, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate this year. And she was savaged by the diaspora because of this, that, and the other, and because she, she, she talks to the Taliban once in a while. Again, engagement does not mean recognition. She argues with them. She pleads with them. She is, uh, in, in French we say la mouche du coche, she's a stone in their shoe, but she's there on a daily basis in Kabul supporting women. And that's the most important thing, and we should take the lead from those women who decided to stay and who are creating their own justice on the ground and use our positions of privilege to, to help them. So I'm going to stop, um, um, to stop there by saying um, that we have very courageous women um, working with us to create their own space. I'll give you another example of you know, what we come across every day. Many organizations, um, uh, and donor agencies tell us, but isn't it dangerous for women to study today in Afghanistan? Well, let them choose. If they choose to study, let them choose. Um, and that's really important. Others um, tell us, you know, oh, there, there's a, um, oh, I'll finish with one more point, but there, there's, there's an agency working with us, it's a, it's a UN agency, that decided that um, there was, I don't know where they saw it, but they, they pulled away from a program they were supported at Kabul University because they decided that there they, they had been an edict, an edict, a Taliban edict against online education of women. I'm still struggling to find it. There's no edict. The Taliban are incapable, and, and, and any, any government, unless they are a really powerful government, are incapable of pulling the plug on Google Classroom, okay, and Google services within a country. And even if they do, we do have VPN um, services that, um, that, you know, that we can exercise. 
What's really important for us in the international community is to stop psychoanalyzing the Taliban and acting uh, in preemption for whatever edict might come along and whatever decision might be taken. And that's also really important. We cannot speak for Afghan women and we should stop psychoanalyzing the Taliban. There are 40 uh, organizations today uh, directly teaching Afghan women in Afghanistan. We've created my university, created an alliance, the Alliance for the Education of Women in Afghanistan. It, it goes from top to bottom. We've got UNESCO, we've got University of the People, we've got uh, um, USIP, United States Institute for Peace, and then we've got grassroots organizations, which, by the way, by the way, are teaching um, um, uh, secondary education uh, for girls in madrasas in some parts of the, the country that are removed enough that there is no ulema here to, to, to decide whether it's acceptable or not, okay? So what's really important to know is that there are organizations that are teaching on the ground uh, and remotely at the moment in Afghanistan. Uh, they are working together, sharing information, and um, and 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 creative, cre you know, and being creative in 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 um, in going around some of the um, uh, some of the issues or some of the um, um, so, so some of the uh, um, uh, edicts that are being um, uh, given by the Taliban. And it's really important. There's always a way to um, to work around what's taking place on the ground. Last example, as part of the Alliance, we have a medical uh, studies group. Uh, 3,000 women are still pursuing their medical studies online through Zoom. Uh, it's a group of Swiss doctors, actually, that's doing it, uh, Dr. Maiwan and, and many others. Uh, there are 200 doctors now. And, and the idea is, okay, fine, everybody is in support of gender justice and women, etc. Where is the accreditation agency that is going to provide accreditation to this learning that is taking place? That is the question as well. Because very often, oh, we love to have Afghan women in our universities for a photo op, but we don't really support the institutions that are working with those Afghan women and that keep um, providing quality education on the ground. And the same happens for accreditation agencies. So, so far, I can tell you, there's only two countries that have supported us, the United States and the state of Qatar. So many other countries talk about, you know, the importance of the education of Afghan women. Only two are putting their money where their mouth is. And I'm going to stop there and thank them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you um, sharing your experience, also how um, many countries, I might say we, are patronizing women around the world and telling them what to do instead of listening, really, and having, letting them having the choice. Um, and um, I think education is a very, very important issue, of course. And you are also uh, teaching education, a peace education. So, so what are the, the most important issues for you in peace education? Who are you educating? Is it students? Is it um, people who want to go into uh, diplomatic service or whatever? So who needs peace education? And what can, can we understand on the peace education, mm -hmm. because maybe this is also something learning not to patronize. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Okay, well, um, I want to make a quick difference between what the center where I work, uh, Austrian Center for Peace, does in peace med uh, education, mm -hmm. and what I have been doing in peace mediation training, so or, okay. or, or master's program in peace mediation. So these are two different things, right? So to your question, peace mediation, uh, sorry, peace education. At our center, you know, it starts for, for, for school children. Um, and Ambassador Schwal, maybe you would even know more than I do. Uh, Ambassador Schwal is, we're lucky to have Ambassador Schwal on our advisory board uh, and, and a very active supporter of our work. But, but their peace education, 
you know, um, uh, courses, um, programs are for young children because it starts from the, you know, early age and they teach, uh, you know, um, from skills to knowledge, but mostly, the, you know, the way you deal with issues at large, right? And um, I cannot speak for my colleagues much, so, um, but that I think at the heart of it is that you start the peace education, uh, both skills and knowledge from the early age. And it can be as something as simple simple for us, and, and forgive me when I say for us, at least in Switzerland and Austria, the culture of dialogue is big, and it starts from the school. It starts from really kindergarten, where there is an issue, the teacher brings the two kids together, something very simple, but extremely important, uh, brings together and says, okay, what happened? Listen to the one, listen to the other, talk to each other, work it out, don't hit each other. Very simple but it has to start from school, the culture of dialogue also in the family. So I think that's one thing. What we teach, the peace, peace mediation, where I have been engaging, that's a totally different level. That's more mm -hmm. adult education. Yes, mostly diplomats, uh, aspiring diplomats, but also those who are interested in mediation. Again, skills and knowledge of mediation. But the not condescending, I think it's an extremely important bit, and I'm glad you met, brought it up. You know, I, I had it in my thoughts as well. When it comes to the W, um, Women, Peace and Security agenda, at large, and, and UN colleagues, you know that more than anyone else, we have this, um, and, and forgive me, the obsessive commitment to that, that we have to actually export it in all countries possible, right? And it's not only with WPS, it's, it's pretty much with peace mediation as well, if you, uh, um, you think about it. But and in, in our research and in our practice, we came across that when we were working with the negotiator women, they were like, we're not interested, A, in that. It was most of the time imposed on us by the donors, and that was used actually by male negotiators who would think like, you know, it's not in our mandate, it's not written, you're just bringing it from outside, and by the way, there are 10 men and only one woman, so what do you want from us? So then we don't walk our talk. So, uh, but, but there I think it's extremely important for us to have that self-reflection moment and say, okay, Every time, at least when I go to third countries as a third party, I don't go like, oh, I'm the white European woman who came with all of this amazing knowledge and experience, so I'm imparting it on you. But rather, you know, we're in this together, right? You, you can use me wherever you need me, basically. And, and forgive me my, um, you know, uh, lack of modesty here, I would say that this was an access for me also to my Ukrainian colleagues for many years when they would, they would know that, okay, you didn't come to teach them something, but actually to learn also from them and, and to see what you can do together. So that, that level of modesty would take us a long way. And, but yeah, so. Uh, and, and this is something I found that women really do. So they, mm. they try to put, the, or they, 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 they try to discuss things at the same eye level and not kind of uh, being more knowledgeable than the others or so. So, no? <laughs> no, 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 unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I could say yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, if you're a gender sensitive woman, if you have the, 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 you know, this, this way of integrative approach of leadership, yes. But no, I have seen a lot of women in power where they just import, uh, impart their wisdom mm -hmm. top down. But it's, it's a power driven, it's not gender driven. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah. Um, questions. Here is a question. Yes, please. All right, thank you very much for your excellent presentation for both of you. And Professor uh, Victoria, nice to see you after a year that you have made finally before the fall of uh, Kabul. We, we met last year, so I still remember that. Um, that said, I have one question for, for each of you. I start uh, with you, Professor Victoria. And you mentioned that um, there is a need for a radical change. In, in the statement you read. But history usually reminds us that radical change usually is a result of either war or revolution. Mm -hmm. So and speaking of radical change, especially in a society such as Afghanistan, when the need to change the software, as opposed to the hardware, when I say software, the norms, the cultures, mm -hmm. is more important actually than the access, the hardware, the material access. 
I think um, the language of radical change may not bode well with the sustainable transformation of the society. So your reflection on that. And the other question for, for uh, uh, Anna, right? Yeah. Um, yes, I, I read a couple of findings or scholarly findings where the so-called um, liberal peace as well as the, uh, the nexus between gender and peace is not um, as, as, as we wish to see it. So it is a mixed bag, but I would like to hear from you your own experience whether gender plays a role in terms of conflict transformation and, 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 and mediation specifically. Is there a specific strategies which are very unique or inherently gendered that women contribute in terms of conflict management. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please. So, um, so the, the, thank you. It's great to see you again. Um, so two answers to your question. Number one on the radical change. I think wh what's really important to mention and I should have is that um, in general, Afghan society is tired of conflict. It's been almost 50 years, and no interlocutor apart from those who sit comfortably in an armchair, you know, far away from Afghanistan, no interlocutor wants a resumption of the conflict. Those who are still fighting are fighting for political power, for um, you know the extraction of minerals, etc., and the wealth that comes with being a warlord. But any um, uh, any person that you see, um, you know, uh, any average person that you see that doesn't have a po any any political um, um, any political gain to have from conflict doesn't want conflict in Afghanistan, and that's across the board. And that's really important to mention because you know in Europe, especially, you know, we are in love with a certain part of you know the insurgency. No, 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 no. That's an old software that we have in France, actually. We've just received uh, somebody uh, with the highest honors who is uh, in favor of the resumption of the conflict, and that's not uh, the ground at all. So that's an important uh, thing to mention. At the same time, talking about um, you know, revolution and radical change, what's really interesting, you know, going back to the software, is that more and more, you know, Gen Z, is not just for our students, it's for the Taliban too. When I was um, um, finally on my way out of Kabul um, after a few days of being stuck there with, with our students, I had two female students in, uh, behind me and we had you know, two um, uh, Taliban minders with Kalashnikovs, you know, etc. And one of them tells his buddy, you know, they were, they were very young, and he says, hey, I was cheerful to them. They were taking videos of me, so I took selfies of them, you know. And, 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 and one of them tells to his friend, hey, I think she likes me. Do you think she'll take me to the US? <laughs> right? So that's the Gen Z. And that's what tells you that this whole software is maybe for old bearded guys in Kandahar. But the young Taliban, they want a different life as well. And I think this is where we find uh, possibilities of engagement and change and, and hopefully, you know, um, um, a different uh, future. Many, um, uh, and again, we're not allowed to, um, as an institution, to speak directly to them by our board, so we don't. But we hear on the grapevine that we are well appreciated as an institution that um, and that what we have to offer uh, is needed by you know many Taliban as well. We know that many Taliban would love to have their daughter study with us, and that's where we can actually um, strike in a way and change the reality without uh, starting the conflict again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, incredible. Okay. Thanks for asking that. Um, a great question, and, and I'm going to now refute myself, right? <laughs> okay. When I said no, so but I, I was going to share um, as a finding from this research again. I mean, it's it's um, let's call it action-based research, right? So it's not an academic research. Uh, so what came out across the board, even um, you know, 
women who didn't care about gender sensitive issues, etc. Right? But the styles, we, we saw there is a commonality across the spectrum. And that was the way of dealing with the issues. It would be like either the values or the approaches. So what I mean is like there was a lot of empathy across the spectrum, right? So that the female or the new way of leadership, let's put it this way, um, uh, most women, almost mo all women, uh, emphasize the importance of empathy. They would use a lot of that. They had that, the listening ability, the patience that comes with the listening ability. It was across the board. So that would be very female-specific thing if you are, you know, in, into, uh, into your own, uh, you know, feminine side of things, let's put it this way. But so relational, and, and we have to be careful here, but not to fall into the surface. Again, it's not all women, but the women that we spoke about. So it was important to acknowledge it. You remember when I said that we did not frame it through the gender angle, but it came out. So uh, empathy, patience, very relational, like really caring about the relationships and not, not, to, uh, not to, you know, be, easily destroy certain relationships. What was very important to see that a lot of women, when they were doing conflict analysis, let's say, it, right, who are the actors who should we talk to, they would go in and they wouldn't talk only to people in power. While, you know, most of the time men would talk only to, well, where's the source of power, right? You don't have time. Who are the key people? Let's talk to the key people. But a lot of the women negotiators and mediators would actually talk to the people in power, but they would also talk to, you know, to the horizontally. So that was also something very specific that came out from that. It was very interesting. I don't know if men have it. It would be interesting for the sake of, uh, you know, uh, conversation. But most of the women said that they use the gender stereotypes that are existing about us uh, to their advantage, <laughs> playing um, helpless to gain more power. I mean, we might, we might actually talk about this in the Ukraine context as well. I think we do that as well in Ukraine, and I see some ladies smiling, so, uh, which is a typical gender stereotype, but some of them were, were playing on this, actually. Some saying, okay, I'm going to put red, red lipstick because I know that has an impact on people, and I'm, I'm going to put, my, you know, when classical feminists would say you shouldn't doll yourself up, right? So, um, and, and then uh, using uh, also something that came very specific, the so-called... Um, cigarette breaks, when the, you know, you are one woman mediator, all men. I mean, imagine the power you have, forgive me for being so, uh, so honest, right? So then the men wouldn't actually compete among, uh, you know, with you because you're the only woman there. So they would, when, when the going was, uh, when the going was getting tough, the woman mediator would call it off, let's go and have a cigarette together, right? A male thing to do in many ways. They would go out, they would, you know, crack jokes and then come back and actually the, you know, the tensions would be eased. Stuff like this. So, I mean, I could go on, but yes, there is a certain commonality across the spectrum. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, there are many. Uh, please, your first question. We, we collect the questions now. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think you just destroyed a lot of <laughs> a lot of norms and a lot of um, you know um, rules that I think we all have had in our mind. And um, I wanted to come back to to this idea of how often um, there is this paternalistic, or it, how often it's imposed this whole gender narrative and feminist vision. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, three years ago, um, I was a member of, um, on the French presidency of G7. Um, they created, uh, President Macron decided that the focus of French presidency in G7 will be uh, gender equality. So he created um, an advisory council on gender equality. Um, and I was a um, member of this advisory council and our task was to draft a document, an advisory document on gender equality uh, policies um, laws that we would suggest for G7 countries, but also partners, uh, to implement. So we, we drafted a document that then became known as a Biarritz Partnership. It was a document full of feminist language, uh, very gendered, you know, mm -hmm. all correct, with a very, very, per like a perfect feminist document. We went with this document, well, it was a draft. I remember one of the meetings we had to present and to push for this document in front of um, uh, foreign ministers. Um, and I, I, I was presenting the document, the draft uh, during that meeting, and there was a, a foreign minister of Rwanda. 
And he said, uh, he listened very carefully, and then he had one reflection. He said, you know, Rwanda is the only country in the world with majority of women in the parliament. And you know what? It has nothing to do with feminism. And it has nothing to do with gender justice. But it had everything to do with peace. Mm -hmm. And we felt so bad about what, the work that we've done so far on our document. And we really went back and rewrote it all. All our, um, you know, we really had to clear up the document mm -hmm. from this feminist hardcore language, which we, th we thought was a noble task. Mm -hmm. So my question will be how often do you, um, well, in your negotiation, you know, peace negotiation, how often you, you try to avoid feminist language? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can okay. collect. Sure. Yeah. Yes, please. No, here, and then. Thank you. There. My question is for Ms. Hesana, if I may. A comment that you made during your intervention stuck with me. You said that you and your colleagues are facing an existential crisis as peace mediators. Um, and so I was wondering what has changed, um, if you can reflect on that. OK, thank you. And one more. Thanks a lot for these uh, super interesting talks. Uh, I'm from the Austrian Foreign Ministry, from the Human Rights Department. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say these were really interesting reflections about engagement and uh, recognition. And I think this applies not only to Afghanistan, but to many countries in the world, where it's important to see what's actually the best uh, way to go forward for the population in the country. Um, which is also why we as the foreign ministry support you and women in, in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask a question so regarding the uh, gender equality in, uh, in peace processes and peace negotiations. The numbers are very, very low, uh, the percentage of women participating in it, as you mentioned it. So I would be interested in what's the way to increase this? Does this need a meta? narrative discussion, or does it need uh, more gender mainstreaming, or does it need uh, a quota for certain negotiations? Um, thank mm. you. Thank you. Um, OK, we, we answer the question, then we make a final round. Yes, please. Who wants to start? Do you want to start? Well, I mean, in, in, the, in the peace negotiations, uh, again, we, we've talked about, you know, sometimes women come in and they don't necessarily talk about women's stuff. I mean, I, I, I do hate having to talk about women's stuff all the time, uh, so I would be guilty as charged, definitely. Um, if we take the example of the uh, Colombian peace process, um, uh, women were not involved in the uh, Havana negotiations, and they demanded to be involved uh, through um, uh, the Jesuit. Uh, they, 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 they went to Havana with the, uh, the Provincial Francisco de Roo and they, they, they stormed in and they just said, you know, we want, um, uh, we want to have a say. And, and I think the same happened in the uh, constitution drafting process in, uh, in Iraq in, in 2005. So there's something to be said about physical presence and about, um, and about physical presence probably of the right people uh, coming from civil society. Um, uh, many of the women in Havana were actually, um, um, were actually from grassroots uh, organizations. So, you know, I would say uh, for me it's about the quantity, it's about the quality, and, uh, and we know that quotas, um, you know, don't yield to um, always the desired results, but, you know, uh, often it does, and for me, when um, it's very difficult when you have power to relinquish it, unless you physically have to. And if we have to go, you know, start from somewhere, it would be that type of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, how often do I have to deal with feminist texts or, or, or push that? I, I have been lucky enough to work in institutions where you are free 
uh, to sort of uh, work based on your expertise, understanding, needs assessment, and mandate. So I have never been, I've, uh, forgive me, uh, well, I have worked for the OEC for a while, I forget that. But um, other than that, in my work, I've never had this imposition on me that by virtue of my position, I have to, you know, uh, squeeze in certain wording into uh, text. If, if I understood your word correctly. So I would, I would use my own judgments, right? Where does that make sense culturally? Uh, where does that make sense for the agenda? Where does that make sense for the participation? Obviously, I have these lenses, right, in me. And, and, but it's, again, it's not only to have the quota, and I would like to uh, tie it uh, to, to uh, your question, sir. But it's about where does it make really sense? Uh, where is it needed? And, and where do I have an influence to bring in without making myself ridiculous? So uh, I might not make myself popular by, with the UN or, or other normative institutions, but that's, that has been my approach. So, um, and, and, and um, if I just uh, go to your question, how do you increase um, the... Okay, my, my quick answer is, if you're not in the decision-making structures... Okay, more women in politics, sorry. More women in war, more women in peacemaking. This is a bad thing to say, but that's what happens, right? So if we don't have women in political processes, then we, what do we do? In certain cultures, they're not part of the political paradigm. So, but it's not only, you have to keep in mind that it's not only the table, so-called so the table. There are other ways of tapping into the issues or tapping into the women's powers, you know, in different formats. It can be consultative forums. It can be, you know, a lot of women don't want to be in public in certain cultures, right? So you don't want to push them into the public because you are compromising their security. It's a security issue. So if if I come from here with my own normative approach and push these women into the public life, then I'm actually, uh, you know, compromising their security. It's a massive issue. So uh, I would say, um, yeah, it's, it's limited, but the answer, and maybe this is uh, a lot of my feminist friends would not like for me saying this, but if we are not in the political sphere, if we're not into this, in decision making, if we're not increasing girls' and women's interest in the political sphere, huh? in leadership roles, wherever it is, then we can't actually increase uh, their participation also in negotiations and peace processes just by quota. So there's a school of thought that says that quota helps, quotas help, I don't know. I'm not sure yet whether that translates into influence, but uh, uh, th there is that approach. What happened, it's a huge conversation, right? But uh, I think what happened, at least from our experience, um, the way we thought the transformative approach of mediation when it comes to certain conflicts or violent conflicts showed its limitation because, okay, how am I gonna say this um, in a short way? Our approach, and I'm saying, you know, that the Western approach to mediation has been very transform, like it's a transformative, it's value-based approach. You transform societies, you transform the states, structures, relations, and then you'll have peace, just like we had in Europe, right? But essentially, we're dealing with conflict parties, and this is not meant to be condescending or judging, right? That are authoritarian most of the time, no? One or the other. The peace processes, the way we think should be, are democratic processes. They're inclusive. They're about bringing everybody on board. They're about transforming. They're about bringing, you know, changing values. The, pe the parties are not interested necessarily, or one of the parties or whatever, are not necessarily interested in that democratic process, right? So it's about settling a certain issue. And most of the time then, this transformative approach doesn't work anymore. This has limitations. You know, we, we come with our approach, we, you know, try to transform them. It doesn't work, wars happen, right? So we have wars because then it's, um, it's quick, right? There's a quick solution. You settle the issue by, you know, occupying somebody's land and then drawing the border. It's easier rather than transforming your own way of governing. So it's, it's a, I don't know if I could explain, but it's a huge uh, Pandora's box if you open, but essentially the difference is that the peace processes, the way we have been conceptualizing and implementing our democratic processes, transformative processes that have shown their limitations in not necessarily democratic settings, that's one. Uh, and, and it's very interesting actually to see right now when we uh, as European actors are facing this, I mean, may maybe other people, I don't want to talk about all of my colleagues, right? It's, it's you know, some of us are dealing with this uh, because essentially in Europe now we don't have space for mediation as well. Can you make peace with an aggressor? Uh, I'm sure we all have answers to this, right? Uh, 
Um, but we have actually the um, emergence of new mediation actors, Qatar. Ambition, you know, to mediate, but not the transformative way, Turkey, China, but more like transactional. Let's bring the parties, we don't touch their way of governance, we don't touch how they organize their societies and their, you know, relations, but we strike a deal, it's about a transaction. You know, Turkey did the grain deal, failed, but, you know, between Ukraine and, and Russia, you know, that the Chinese did between Saudis and I Iran, right? It has nothing to do with value exportation, it was about transactions. So, I hope. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's that's how I see it at least, or how I experience it. Mm -hmm. So now uh, the last questions. Uh, yes, please, and then here. Thank you, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I have a question. Um, to Professor Fontan, as you have been in, in Afghanistan, how about the neighboring country, Iran? We had this uh, rebellion of hundreds of thousands of women. However, uh, the power is with the revolutionary guards, with the Pastoran, with, with uh, religious uh, guards, civil, uh, um, uh, all sorts of, of, of power structures, uh, and, and you are facing death sentence, etc. Now, uh, I wonder if there's any outcome, because it lasted for quite a long time, this, this rebellion. Uh, and the other thing is also international reaction was next to zero, actually. I mean, uh, uh, no, nobody supported that, of course, but uh, sanctions are already against Iran. What else can you do? With it? Was there anything, uh, not to my knowledge? So what, what's the result? Uh, thank um. you. I, I cannot say. Uh, I know. I know that we we have some students uh, in uh, in Iran, and uh, they're unable to um, even. I mean, I was talking about powerful countries being able to pull the plug on certain websites. Iran certainly does. We we uh, we can't access our learning management system from there. Um, f f for me, you, th there is a movement. There is repression. There are. Uh, I mean, on a massive scale. Um, and it's going to take, um, I, I mean, I don't know what to say, you know, going to a country, invading it, toppling, um, uh, toppling a government and then making peace without that uh, party to the conflict, i.e., you know, the Taliban were not part of the bone process in 2003 and throwing money at the problem for 20 years, it doesn't solve anything either. So I think it's going to have to, you know, be an organic process. But then what does it mean when you are stuck in prison because you took your veil off? It's very difficult to say. Uh, but uh, I, so I, I can't comment on that. But um, th things are, I mean, unbelievably bleak for women over there, too. Thank you. And the last question was here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anna Pataman. I am a Ukrainian activist uh, representing Andimetu Democracy. Um, dear Anna, um, partly you already answered my question. I was wondering whether you personally experienced situations or cases of limitations of negotiations and mediations in conflict resolution. Could you tell us something about that? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Just clarification whether I have seen it myself as part of negotiations. Yes, yes, the short answer is yes, I have. And, and that's where partially some of the frustration comes from, where you see I have been, I have been uh, working uh, on not any more protracted conflicts, that's like you have active war um, uh, in, in the OAC area, in the South Caucasus, uh, namely Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan and uh, the Ukraine means process. Mm -hmm. and, and I have seen both wars exploding after years of negotiations. So that will be my short answer. I'm happy to talk to you about it if you have more specific questions, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, our panelists. Uh, from the second panel, from the first panel, um, I think we all got a lot of food for thought, really. Um, thank you, the audience, for participating and being here and the team of the 
uh, Austrian Institute. Thank you very much uh, for organizing this event. Um, I have uh, the pleasure to tell you that you get a glass of academia wine, right? <laughs> if you want, uh, over there. Uh, and uh, just a little reception, so uh, maybe we can continue some talks over there. Thank you very much for coming. I think it was a very interesting and very informative and also very moving um, evening. Um, thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>